Acacia puce was once more widespread across central Australia. But as the continent dried out and the sand dunes of the Simpson Desert moved in, the population became more and more fragmented. Realising the unique ecological value of these trees on the edge of the desert, the Clarks decided to fence off two stands of acacia puce. Molly and her husband were hardcore pastoralists, no doubt about it. But ironically, they were also pioneering conservationists. And here we are, the Matt Clark Reserve. It lies 40 kilometres north of the homestead in a sandy, arid landscape. So, these are Australia's loneliest trees. I see what they mean when they say it. I mean, what are they doing out here? These acacia puce are now protected within a 30 square kilometre reserve. And helped by some unseasonal, record-breaking rains, the population is bouncing back. It's not exactly a forest. But the trees are definitely grouped together in the landscape, just all a little bit spread out. And they stand out like anything, right? Because it's flat as a tack around here. They're the only thing that's standing tall. And the really big ones, they look really funny, actually. They look a little bit like a Dr. Seuss tree because there's more trunk than there is leaves to these trees. So they look a little bit like they've got stunted fingers. And some of them make really weird shapes. They look like they're dancing with each other or they've got a funny little lean to them into the wind. What a magnificent tree. So, Anne, we're heading to one of 25 regeneration monitoring plots for acacia puce. Dr Catherine Nano is leading a team of scientists monitoring the recovery of the trees at the reserve. So these plots were set up in 1979 and have been monitored through to this point in time. So we've got a really good history of the growth rates of this species. Yep, here we have the tag. Oh, OK, so there's these, this tiny little yeah, tag down here. So these tags were number... set up 40 years ago yeah. now, when these recruits were just seedlings. Wait, so 40 years ago, this tree, which is not even taller than me yet, mm -hmm. was a seedling? Was a seedling, yeah. So it's taken 40 years to get to this point. And Absolutely. with all due respect, it looks like a Christmas tree. It looks like a Christmas tree. So that um, reflects it, its name. It's um, a conifer-like foliage in the, in the juveniles. Oh. And so this is quite spiky. It is extremely spiky. <laughs> And theory would have it that it's um, a protective mechanism that goes back to the days when it had megafauna possibly predating on it. So the juveniles were in reach of the megafauna, and, but all the while they were spiky and um, discouraging severe defoliation. Having very thin leaves also stops the tree losing excessive moisture through transpiration. So right. what measurements do we need to take? We um, start with height. Use one of these stadia rods and probably this is one of the few times where I've had to extend it. Really? <laughs> They're always little. Yeah, we're on the move now. Things are really cranking, I'd say, in this population. Yeah, so um, that's our one metre mark. And we're almost hitting the two metre mark. Wow. Which is, yeah, quite sensational, I'd say. So. Why is it that it's, o well, only put on a metre in the last 12 years? Um, that's a really good question. I think it's part of the life history strategy of this species. So we get these really rare recruitment events um, where the thing germinates, there's enough rainfall for the seedlings to survive, and then very, very slow growth. And I, we presume that the growth is more downward. So, um, allocating to root growth ra rather than to shoot growth. Ah. So that would be um, in the context of an arid environment where you get rare rainfall events and so it's seeking soil moisture. Their specialisation is to sit and wait. 
So, like, they've been called Australia's loneliest tree, but maybe they should be called Australia's most patient tree. I think so. <laughs> and, and the researchers, too. <laughs>